This week on Jerusalem Dateline, ISIS strikes again, this time in the heart of Paris. Plus, a look into the suffering church in the Middle East. Immediately when they hear something bad, we'll hear them say God is good. And Israel remembers the Holocaust when six million Jews died. And Operation Blessing brings bread and hope to a northern Iraqi town devastated by ISIS. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. ISIS claimed responsibility for a terror attack in the heart of Paris. Charlene Aaron reports. The attack happened just after 9 p.m. in the heart of Paris. A gunman armed with military-style weapons walked up to a police van and opened fire. I saw three, three guys coming in a Greece Audi and shoot on the police and kill one of the police and injure one. Then I have to run away. I was here walking in the Champs-Élysées. The gunman killed one police officer and seriously wounded two other officers before other police killed him. A woman tourist was also injured. ISIS claims responsibility and may have been directly involved rather than just inspiring the attack. French authorities say the suspect was reportedly detained in February for threatening police, then freed. Police searched his home in eastern Paris overnight. President Trump condemned the attack. Our condolences from our country to the people of France. It looks uh, like another terrorist attack and uh, what can you say? The attack comes just days before the first round of the French elections on Sunday. Some think it might help the far-right candidate Marie Le Pen, who has taken a hard line on immigration issues and terrorism. The attack shows the ongoing threat in France and elsewhere in Europe, and it could lead to growing public pressure on governments to stop Islamic terrorism. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. On another front in the war against Islamic terror, Israel has a warning for the world. Its defense officials say Syria still has up to three tons of chemical weapons. Laboratory tests show victims of the April 4th chemical attack were exposed to sarin nerve gas or a similar banned toxin. The U.S. and Israel believe Syrian President Bashar Assad's weapons killed 90 people inside Syria. A senior Israeli military official says Syrian military commanders ordered the attack and Assad knew it. Evidence also shows ISIS and other insurgents have acquired some of these chemical weapons. Syria's ally Iran celebrated its army day with a military parade in Tehran. Iranian President Hassan Rouhani said that Iran's military power stands as merely a deterrent and serves only a defensive purpose. One of the highlights of the parade was a Russian-made air defense system called the S-300. Iran recently imported and deployed the system, which many analysts consider one of the best in the world. For years, Israel tried to prevent the system from being deployed since it makes any future military strike against Iran's nuclear program much more difficult. U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson addressed Iran's nuclear program and criticized former President Obama's nuclear agreement with Iran. He warned just how dangerous a nuclear Iran could be. An unchecked Iran has the potential to travel the same path as North Korea and take the world along with it. Tillerson says the Iran deal doesn't prevent Iran from going nuclear, it only delays it. Here in Jerusalem, U.S. Defense Secretary James Mattis met with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. They both spoke of the need to confront the dangers in the region. The common dangers are based on the twin threats of uh, militant Islam, the Shiite uh, extremists led by Iran, the Sunni extremists led by Daesh. We are committed to thwarting these dangers uh, as we are committed to seize the common opportunities and great opportunities uh, that I think are before us, Mr. Secretary. I think it's important that we remind ourselves that if good people don't band together, then bad people can do a lot of damage in this world and uh, we're committed to stopping that and doing whatever it takes to pass on peace and freedom to the next generation. Washington's new muscular approach to foreign policy has caused Israel to rethink its own strategy toward both allies and enemies. We sat down this week with two men who have been key figures in Israel and their brothers. Retired Major General Michael Herzog is with the Near East Policy Institute 
and his brother Itzhak Herzog is chairman of Israel's leading opposition party, the Zionist Union. Both told us they're encouraged by the opportunities the Trump administration presents for dealing with moderates in the Arab and Muslim world, as well as enemies like North Korea and Iran. North Korea seems very tied to Iran as well. How would you describe, would you describe the threat of Iran's nuclear program that much greater than even North Korea's? North Korea holds to nuclear uh, mm -hmm. capabilities, which Iran does not. But I think, uh, notwithstanding the nuclear deal with Iran, the threat is still there. We just, you know, maybe bought some time, but the threat is there because the infrastructure is there, the ambitions are there, and once most restrictions are lifted within uh, 15 years, uh, Iran could be very close to the threshold. It could be very difficult to stop Iran. And I'm concerned about uh, cooperation between Iran and North Korea. There is a history of cooperation on missiles. Uh, North Korea helped Syria at the time build a nuclear reactor, which according to uh, international media was destroyed by Israel. So I would look very carefully uh, at these ties. Mm. I would add that uh, 2007, summer of 2007, according to foreign sources, Israel destroyed a nuclear reactor which was built by Bashar al-Assad, the butcher from Damascus, uh, just before it was about to be turned on. Think about what would have been the implications. It was a North Korean reactor. Clearly the North Koreans and the Iranians are uh, the rogue states of the world and one needs to be very tough and clear with them about uh, their whereabouts and activities. Mm. Final question for both of you is uh, there's a new administration in town. How has that changed the calculus here in the Middle East? And what do Americans in particular need to know? And what would you advise the administration to go ahead and do now that it's involved in the Middle East? Well, first of all, realize it's a very complex region. There are peoples here. There are nations here. There are conflicting national movements here. Israel needs to be very strong, always hold the uh, qualitative edge against all the region at once and against, of course, Iran as the main perpetrator of hate and uh, instability in the region. Uh, on the other hand, it also leads to opportunities. The, this is a transitional historical period. We should be on top of things and lead things uh, and use the greatness of Israel as part of it. Yeah. Uh, th this, uh, first I think the U.S. has to rebuild uh, deterrence and uh, credibility in the region because there is a deficit there, unfortunately. I would say my first priority is to check uh, the destabilizing policies of Iran while defeating ISIS and not one at the expense of the other. Hmm. Anything you'd like to add, either of you, Mr. Chairman? Well, Chairman? Uh, all I can conclude by saying that I think that the message that was sent by President Trump to Assad by the 59 Tomahawks resonates throughout the Middle East, should be very clear with no ifs and buts, was a very correct and to the point message. I hope these messages will explain that there is a new game in town. Mm. And some people would say a new sheriff in town and well, certainly I sends a... We are, we are polite. <laughs> 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 Mr. Chairman, General, thank you so much. You can see more of Michael and Isaac Herzog in our news coverage next month surrounding CBN's new docudrama, In Our Hands, The Battle for Jerusalem. Tickets for a one-time showing of the film on May 23rd in theaters throughout the U.S. are now on sale. You can go to inourhands1967.com for more information on theater locations and how to get tickets. Up next, Standing in the Fire, the heroic stories of Christians in the face of persecution. Welcome back to Jerusalem Dateline. Middle East Christians are standing right in the middle of a blazing inferno of radical Islamic evil. Even as they fight to survive, the gospel is going forward. It's being shared by an unlikely band of believers, risking their lives to share their faith, no matter how hot the fire may get. Take a look. Global terrorism is at an all-time high. Millions of Middle East Christians experience brutal persecution for their faith every day. But that's not the whole story. In the midst of the chaos caused by ISIS and other jihadist factions, a growing number of fearless followers of Jesus Christ are risking their own lives to share the gospel. 
Some of these courageous Christians are former Muslims, and some were once terrorists. Former pastor and Middle East missionary Tom Doyle tells their amazing true stories in a new book, Standing in the Fire, Courageous Christians Living in Frightening Times. Tom Doyle talked with CBN's Wendy Griffith about these courageous Christians. Well, how did you gather all these amazing stories? Where did you hear about them? Well, you know what? We work with many of these people, and of course we work all throughout the Middle East. We wanted to write a book about those that are alive, that really should be dead, but Jesus has kept them alive. And so it's a former ISIS leader, a former Javad al-Nusra, that's a terrible terrorist group in Syria, Mm -hmm. secret police, woman married to a, a Muslim imam that are alive, serving Christ and God's using their lives. They're always asked the two questions before they give their lives to Jesus. One, are you willing to be persecuted? Mm. And then if they answer yes, the next question, are you willing to die for Jesus? And and I think about that, Wendy, Can, can you imagine if we had those questions in the church today here in America, that would thin the ranks quick. And a lot of times uh, they never see their families again or the families, so their families just cut them off. Totally right? reject them. In fact, they may be persecuted by their family, which is so foreign for us that their own family could persecute them, even kill them, which is so sad, but it happens. Now, Tom, we hear a lot now today about Christianity actually disappearing yeah. in some parts of the Middle East. Is this true? What about the Muslims that are coming to faith in Christ? What about in the last 10 to 15 years, more Muslims have come to faith in Jesus than in 1,400 years of Islam. So 10 to 15 years compared to 1,400 years. There's an underground revolution that people don't know about, and that's why we wanted to tell the stories. Why why do you think they are coming to faith in Christ? Because we don't hear about that on the news. We just hear about ISIS and Al-Qaeda and all the terrorism. We don't hear about the Muslims. Yes. Why is this happening? Well, you know, I think one, I think Jesus is reaching out to them. We know about the dreams. We know about the visions, spectacular miracles they are seeing. Two, they're seeing Islam for what it really is. Right. And they don't like it. And then three, they're seeing Christians with love that are reaching out to them that they trust and they want to know more. Tell us the story of one of these brave new Mm. converts to Christianity. Well, you know, I think one of them that just hits me in the heart is Mido, who was with the Islamic State in Mosul when the Christians were driven out. As Mosul's being cleared out of Christians, he walked around a corner and he saw three men hung on crosses. And he didn't know this was going on. And he walked up to him, He he was just transfixed on them. And one of the men lifted his head, probably within the hour he was going to die, and he smiled at Mido. Mm. And then he got closer and he heard a noise, and they were singing. Oh, my goodness. They were singing songs to Jesus. And at that point, he felt like taking his own life. He Mm. said, I could have killed myself then. Made a plan, got away, escaped through northern Iraq, got into Turkey, met some believers. Within about a week, they led him to Christ. But really what hit his heart as they took him to an underground church meeting. And as they walked in, he started to backpedal Wendy. And the man said, what, what's the matter? What's the matter, Mito? And he said, mm-hmm. that's the same song those men were singing on the cross. Oh my goodness. And it pierced him. And he came to faith in Christ. What can we in the West learn from these, these brave converts? Yes, well, you know what? We have three takeaways in the book. And the first one is we, we talk about, choose what voice you're gonna listen to. If we just listen to secular news, we're going to be worried. We're going to be panicked. It's, it's going to be negative for us. None of this should surprise us. That right. The gospel is soaring through the Middle East. Choose who you listen to, what voice you listen to, and then make faith your filter. And I must confess, Wendy, it's easy for me to, to worry. We have six children, four grandchildren. Sure. Joanne and I think about them and, oh, my gosh, what's happening with this one and that one? And, yeah. and they, they don't think that way. Immediately when they hear something bad, we'll hear them say, God is good. And then third, I think it's time for believers to get on their faces and pray. Absolutely. Real radical prayer. That's what I see them do in the Middle East. And, yeah. you know, we think of FaceTime as like an app on our phone, but believers have been getting <laughs> on their face for centuries when they needed God to move. Amen. And they were trusting Him. So I'd say those three things we've learned from them and a lot more. Your eighth book is called Standing in the Fire, Courageous Christians Living in Frightening Times. But yes. as you said, God is good. This is a great book and you need to get it and we need to pray. Tom Doyle, God bless you. Thanks for what you're doing. Thank you so much, Wendy. God bless you. Great to be with you. One of those persecuted Christians is American pastor Andrew Brunson. After serving in Turkey for 23 years, he was jailed last October. 
accused of being in an Islamist terrorist organization. We posted this on our Facebook page this week. It's an example of what you can find throughout the week on social media. Brunson wrote a letter to President Trump asking for his help in obtaining his release. Let's remember to pray for Pastor Brunson. Up next, see how one Holocaust survivor uses art to tell her story. Welcome back. This week, Israelis are marking Holocaust Remembrance Day. One of the commemorations is at Israel's Yad Vashem Memorial. About 200,000 survivors still live in Israel. And one of them showed us how she shares her experience during perhaps the darkest time in modern history. This painting is a recent one. I named it uh, uh, The Wounded Survivor. Rita Kazimel Brown was seven years old when the Nazis invaded her hometown of Termot in Poland. In 1941, Nazis rounded up the Jews there and put them in a ghetto. Rita is now a recognized Holocaust artist who has worked as an art therapist. Her survival experience is the theme of many of her paintings. I'm the wounded survivor. I always uh, painted myself in white. I think it uh, has to do with not so white nightgown that I survived the whole Holocaust in. Rita is bubbly and vibrant. Okay. If not for her artwork and her story, you might never know her painful past. Yet she carries her memories with her every day. I'm not sure if it's totally that you cannot heal the wound. It's something that's, that still works in your memory and it affects your daily life. Her story is told in the book, Portrait of a Holocaust Child, Memories and Reflections. Rita told CBN News how she and her family escaped the ghetto and survived in what they called the grub. And my father went away for a few, for a few days. And what he did, he found another Christian family in a little town called Malaki. And there he dug a big pit under the stable and it had a connection to the potato bin and a ledge you can open to the, to the farmer's uh, uh, home. My father and uh, my mother and the two little kids were with, her, with them and only my little brother could stand up. And I was lying in the passageway from the pit to the potato bin. This is how we lived 20 months. We were hungry and fearful, and uh, it was just a living hell. It was, we called it, uh, it was a living grave. Being awake was a nightmare, she said, hour by hour, suffering day and night. Most of her father's 12 siblings died, while her little family of five stayed alive. Being creative helped me survive, but not only survive, but keep my sanity. In 2006, Rita revisited Poland for the first time to join the March of the Living. While there at Auschwitz, a spider bite took special significance. And there is this black spider that bit me, and it looks a little bit like a swastika. Yeah. And it's also soaked with blood. A mother of two and grandmother of three, she's seen many miracles in her life. We have kind of a, a survival instinct which was very strong, but now it's weakening because when you get older, your, your defenses go down. And so the only thing that we have is because of our children and grandchildren. That's our victory. Up next, a plea from the land devastated by ISIS. Welcome back. Christians in Iraq are returning to their homes in cities that have been liberated from ISIS. And Operation Blessing is there to help them start over. George Thomas has that story. On a recent trip to the front lines, Operation Blessings President Bill Horan saw firsthand what ISIS did to Iraq's largest Christian town. I'm standing here on the roof of a church, a historic church in Karakosh, Iraq. This is a community of over 50,000 people. Every man, woman and child was a Christian that lived in this community. On August 6, 2014, Christians of Karakosh fled just hours before Islamic fighters overran the area. ISIS practically destroyed the entire town over the next two years, turning almost every church like this one into their playground of evil. Evidently, they didn't have enough explosives to, to blow it down. They used the courtyard down here for a shooting range. 
They took artifacts from the church, sacred relics, some of them hundreds of years old, and used them for literally for target practice and expended thousands, tens of thousands of rounds down in this courtyard practicing how to kill people. Then, in October of last year, Iraqi troops, backed by U.S. forces, recaptured Karakosh. Months later, residents of the town are slowly trickling back. Operation Blessing is on the ground, helping some families rebuild. This month, the Christian humanitarian organization started the city's first business since its liberation by assisting this family start a bakery to supply fresh bread to people coming home. But many residents are still too afraid to return as fighting rages on less than 20 miles away in Iraq's second largest city of Mosul. For now, the majority of Karakosh's Christians are living as refugees in neighboring Jordan. Operation Blessing is helping them too. The group is feeding over 300 Christian refugee children from Karakosh at their school in Amman. Most refugees, they don't have meals, okay, for our resources to feed their children. So many children, they come without any meals having at home. So we says that they have a good meal at the school. Father Khalil runs the facility. Before we start the school, the kids pray with me all together. The, our father in Aramaic, the, the language of our Lord Jesus Christ. Operation Blessing also funds a clinic that's helping refugees displaced by ISIS. And people in America have to be more aware of this and have compassion for our brothers and sisters here. These are all believers in Christ, and we have to do all we can possibly do to help them rebuild their lives. George Thomas, CBN News. After having seen the devastation in Karakosh firsthand, I agree people in America and around the world need to be more aware of the crisis many Christians are facing in northern Iraq. Please pray for these people and do what you can to help. If you'd like to contribute to Operation Blessing, you can go to ob.org. That's all for this edition. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And please share us with your family and friends. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.